I'm here in Southern California. I've dropped by Honda because I want to learn about a new technology that Honda is working on. It's called Vehicle to Grid. Now you might have heard Vehicle to Grid before, but in concepts involving large, high-powered DC rapid charging stations. Honda is instead working on V2G rollout for all of its future plug-in vehicles that uses the regular 240 volt charging stations that you have in your home. Slightly modified, but using those systems in your home. So I'm here with Ryan from Honda and he's gonna tell me a little bit about the program. Tell us a little bit about what V2G is and why it's important and what Honda's vision of it is in the future. We think that vehicle to grid technology can improve the value of the electric vehicle for everybody in the system. For example, it enables the electric car to be used as an energy storage device to mitigate the intermittency of renewable energy throughout the system. It enables the distribution utility to be able to optimize the electric vehicle charging in order to uh, provide value to their distribution system. It enables entire society to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enables the customer at their own site to optimize time of use energy management. Maybe they can save some money on charging their car as well as uh, uh, saving some demand charge management for commercial sites. So everybody in the system can improve the value of an electric vehicle to them. So some of your competitors, I'm not gonna name them, have high power DC rapid charging systems. What makes the level two AC system that Honda's developed so unique? Honda took a, a holistic view of the technology and we thought the way that we can make it applicable to everyone and most beneficial is to absolutely reduce the cost of V2G technology. We've developed um, bi-directional AC on board the vehicle so that every single car already comes capable of doing V2G in the future and having it in AC enables us to do that conversion on the car for very low cost compared to having just a simple one-way onboard charger. There's no special um, conversion hardware that's required offboard the car. It's an EVSE, electric vehicle supply equipment or charger, that's very similar to the typical AC chargers that you see in every parking lot or on every wall. So by keeping the system cost very, very low, that makes it accessible, any customer should be able to do it, and applicable, that everyone should want to do it because the cost of doing it is far less than the benefit they would get from doing it. Right, and we're talking seven kilowatts charging capability and feeding back to the grid capability. What do you call it? You can't call it discharging, yeah. right? We haven't announced exact specs yet, but it'll be in the five to five to six kilowatt range. And what do you expect people to be using this technology for primarily? Every utility jurisdiction will have a little bit different business model for V2G. So the customer of V2G um, is typically the utility. So they're gonna need some energy storage in their distribution system in order to make their system work in a future of you know, massive penetration of distributed renewables, as well as you know, massive penetration of large scale, utility scale renewables in the system. We need energy storage and we need the means of controlling distribution networks to make sure that everybody has the power quality that's, um, that they require for their site. So V2G, can provide services to the distribution utility. Now, the wholesale market, the, the independent system operators, also need energy storage in the, in the system in order to, to uh, match the bulk you know, wholesale supply of power with the wholesale, wholesale demand of electricity at the market level. And so those two things together, the distribution utility managing their network um, with energy storage services, as well as the bulk energy storage system being controlled by the independent system operator will provide value to those two, two customers. And what we've seen through you know, many layers of university studies, um, University of Irvine showed that to get to a 100% renewable grid, you need to install massive energy storage. If you do V1G controlled charging, you can reduce the cost of that by a factor of four. If you get to full implementation of V2G, you can reduce that completely, 100% of the energy system side installation of energy storage, you can bring to zero. Now, nobody expects that every car in every location would have that, so there's some balance between utility side energy storage and using V2G, but that shows the direction. And then for the private customer, um, behind their own meter again, being able to optimize their, you know, when they charge and when they discharge power according to time of use rates or according to um, uh, real-time energy prices in order to get some private benefit for them, uh, is what we see everybody 
you know, doing with the, uh, with the V2G technology. So let's talk about, obviously, the private benefit to car owners, because yes. that's ultimately where people watching this channel are going to be interested. Right. You're asking consumers to keep their cars plugged in when they're at home or at their work or, or wherever there's yeah. V2G connection. And you're essentially asking them to give away electricity for free, right? I mean, use the battery, put put strain on the battery pack. How, how do you combat that? How do you convince people that actually this is a good idea and the benefit yeah. outweighs the disadvantages? So, certainly the vehicle customer is the most important actor in the system, right? They have made a purchase decision to buy this car to give them transportation utility. It's what they want to do with it. And that has to be respected above all other uses of the vehicle. That being said, um, we've developed a Honda Smart Charge app to be able to take information from the customer that you know, that customer is willing to give up a certain little bit of the battery. Do they want to participate? Yes or no. Um, when they do participate, what's the, the value threshold that the system has to provide to them in order to participate? We'll give all of that control directly to the customer in a simple, standard, you know, set it and forget it method. So they don't have to be thinking every day about what the car is going to be doing. Are they going to have enough energy to get to work in the morning? All of that will automatically be taken into account in the, in the, in the system. OK, so surely that's going to cause the battery to degrade faster. After all, you're asking customers to charge and then discharge their battery packs. Cycling their battery packs for the use of the greater good, won't that mean they'll have to replace their batteries more frequently? Well, the, the surely part is not so surely. So Honda's done some detailed studies. We've published papers in the Society of Automotive Engineers, World Congress. Those papers are publicly available. Um, when you introduce smart charging and vehicle-to-grid technology to, to the system, um, you change how the vehicle is charged. So the single biggest degradation mechanism of lithium-ion battery is time spent at 100% state of charge. So if you think about it, a typical person would get home from work, plug in their car, it'll charge in the first hour or two hours, and then sit there for the next 10 hours fully charged. That's the worst thing that you can do to lithium-ion battery. With controlled charging or V2G technology, um, that car would be used to cycle or spend more time at a lower state of charge and then only achieve the highest state of charge at the time that the customer needs it, when they've told us they need to use the car. The second part of degradation of lithium-ion batteries is um, you know, carbon, carbon anode um, solid electrolyte interface buildup. Now typically that's a time-based function. One of the things that makes it better is low power, high frequency cycling of, of the battery, charge discharge. And when a V2G connected car provides a frequency regulation service, it'll be acting like that. You know, small pulse of power in, small pulse of power out. And the you know, anode health of the degradation of the battery is better in that case than in, uh, if it was just sitting there doing nothing at all. Now, it's true that if you were to do deep discharge of the battery and then deep charge, full charge of the battery, multiple times, that eats into the life of the battery. But that's something that, given the system together, we can make sure that we simply don't do. So for example, when we aggregate many thousands of cars together and we take into account every car's life and every customer's preference, add it all up and we know exactly how much service we can offer to the utility or to the independent system operator. In taking into account everybody's preference, the degradation health of, the, of each battery, and we can make sure that each private customer's battery is not harmed by our performing V2G. And then frankly, uh, it's our responsibility as an auto manufacturer, we're going to develop a car for a purpose, to provide V2G. We have to make sure then that we've designed it appropriately, developed it appropriately, and provided sufficient warranty to the customer that if they use that car in the capacity that we've intended, that it meet their expectation of, uh, of the life of the car. So it sounds as if this system is almost ready to go. You've said you've got the technology and it's on the shelf, but there are some roadblocks to this becoming a commercial reality. You've got to get buy-ins from the utility companies. You've got to get the hardware developed and designed and, and in customers' homes so that they can do this two-way power transfer because I'm assuming they can't use existing charger technology for that. So how long until we actually see this technology in the marketplace and can we do anything about using the technology now? Uh, certainly. Uh, vehicle to grid technology is something where auto manufacturers have developed the technology. It's 
say 95% technically finished, it's on the shelf. The remaining 5% is about technical integration of standards, communication standards that will dictate some hardware and communications in the system. So that needs to be developed uh, in conjunction with the utilities, in cooperation with the utilities. They need to tell us what system settings they want to use, what communications they want to perform, what services in their service territory they want to use in order for us to be able to apply vehicle-to-grid technology in their service territories. Now this will be complex because there's a lot of utilities, more than 3,000 utilities in the United States. And everyone will have a little bit different business model that uh, the system is going to have to take into, into account for them to be able to apply. And so there are standards and hurdles and, and uh, the EVSC itself needs to be developed to meet the needs of the system. So all of this will take time. What customers can do today, and a technology that we've developed today, is we call controlled charging, or V1G, which is you know, half of uh, V2G. Um, that enables the customer to be able to, uh, to simply monetize the charging control of their car uh, for the benefit, again, of the utility, for the electric grid, for the independent system operator, and for renewable, um, renewable integration. Simply controlling the charge timing of an electric car can provide significant system value. So that's something we've developed through what we call Honda Smart Charge, which is integrated into our app for the vehicles that gives uh, controlled charging technology to uh, everyone with a Honda Fit EV. And you have a Honda Fit EV. You're not I do. someone who just works at Honda who drives a petrol car. You have that's a Honda true. Fit EV. I've been happily driving a Fit EV for about four years now. And you have the program, you're enrolled in the program. So how's it working for you? Obviously, you're involved in the program, but, but yeah. tell us about the experience. Uh, so simply, uh, each user has a, has a smartphone app. We call it Honda Link EV. And in that app is a smart charge feature. You set a location-based profile. So I can say, I can set one for my home and I can tell the system, I only want the car to charge at home between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Because that's when I have a time of use rate from my utility that reduces my cost of charging. So when I get home from work and I plug my car in at you know, 5, 6, 7 p.m., it'll wait until 9, and then between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m., it will automatically pick the best intervals that reduce cost and integrate the most renewable energy for everyone. And then by 5 a.m., my car will be fully charged and I can go to work and I don't have to worry about it. And uh, Honda will send a uh, small part of the, of the total system savings uh, to me. And that's a pretty good perk for making the system better. So how long is it going to be before we're going to see this technology implemented in the real world? Obviously, people can sign up for yep. the smart charge if they live in California. That's correct. So we're currently integrated um, with the California independent system operator. Uh, to provide this service. Um, every market is a little bit different. You need enough cars in a given market in order to meet the market rules to bid different services into the market, so uh, it'll take time. But over the course of the next few years, we expect to roll out V1G Honda Smart Charge um, to products you know, throughout the US. And again, every single utility may be a little bit different. It's gonna be you know, difficult to reach everybody, but in those places where we can you know, provide benefit by adding this uh, technology. Uh, we're committed to doing that. Thank you very much, Ryan. So there you have it. That's vehicle to grid technology. I know that we'd all like Honda to bring it to market straight away. And I know we'd also like Honda to bring the Honda E to the USA, but I, I, I don't think they're going to. I did try. Thanks for watching. As always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you know the minute a new show is uploaded. Support the channel through Patreon, Ko-fi or buy something from our shop and I'll be back soon with more goodness. But until then, I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Keep evolving.